Good morning, and welcome to another exciting edition of Day 4 with the man, Frank Scalish, Day 4, number 152. 152. We're up against it this morning, Frank. Yeah, we are. <laughs> Day 1, Lake Fork, Bassmaster Elite Series. Freak show already going down. It's only 8.30 in the morning there. We've seen 8s, 9s, multiple 7s. They're just whale roping them. You know... <laughs> whale roping i'm frank i i i really miss some of those fisheries dude i i have to be honest with you i had a i had an opportunity to fish fork back in the day and it was ludicrous you know way before way before uh forward facing sonar came out and it was still ludicrous they're catching them so good i spit my coffee out on my shirt see right outstanding there. good job man good yeah, job out right of you there. Right perfect there. I did decide to shave after and cut. I did a haircut after like I was kind of looking like grizzly out of someone made a comment that I was starting to look like Mark when I had the <laughs> facial hair and the glasses <laughs> and that just really hit home to me. So I was like, you know what? I need to do a little, little personal daycare. Good for you, man. To get back in the game. Yeah. You're looking I, fantastic I, as always. How have you I been? chose not to shave uh, today. I said, oh, you, you know what? Tell. You can't tell because I just started. <laughs> this morning but uh you know whatever normally says, I, but, who's split screening with bass on mute that would be me i already told frank two days ago that that was the plane i know and it's really bums me out because i need your undivided <laughs> attention <laughs> i'm just kidding we have undivided <laughs> attention today uh thank you for those of us who enjoyed us live uh for the for the rest of you we got a really uh really good show today uh we're going to bloviate for a little bit and then dive and then, into uh because because well here because i'll tell you what you guys it's from time to time i i have a guest on um day four and today i'm gonna have a guest on um in the after we bloviate for a minute or two we're gonna pull on a guest we and, are um yeah and i'm gonna ask him some questions who you, you dumbass. <laughs> oh, I thought maybe I totally missed something because we have guests. I was like, I didn't get a link. You didn't say anything about it at I, all. I was freaking you out. No, you're my guest today. I have questions for you, young man. I got you. Well, before we get to that, you had uh, oh, you had have started a to tell me a story before we went live because uh, because we usually sit and, and just shoot the bull for a couple minutes. And I said, whoa, 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 whoa. Save it for the show. About your trailer. Yeah, 100%. And, and like we went through a year and a half, I think all of us feel intimately familiar with the uh, legend and yes. the issues you've been through with the motor, the boat, and the trailer, and all that stuff. So hopefully, is this like the last chapter? You got everything up and running. You got the electronics, you got the motor, you got the boat. Now you got the trailer. Well, here's the story this has been a very exciting couple weeks for me because I have a brand new trailer underneath the legend. Um, I got, you saw last show, I have, I got all my stuff from the bass tank. So I've, I've got my new forward facing stuff and the harnesses and everything. Um, Saturday, I'm going down to Frankie's and we're going to get into it and put all the stuff on it. Uh, the trailer is remarkable. Um, I'm so excited that I, I, I'm so excited about it. I can't even see straight. Um, <laughs> I, 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 you don't understand. I mean, when I tell you my trailer was falling apart, when I got down to the place, they asked me how I got the boat there. Really? Yeah. That's not um, like you. No, it's uh, well, because, because there's damage that occurred in the tube of the trailer that I was not aware of. Okay. I saw things starting to happen and I got really nervous cause I'm, I know better. And so I had to make the move on it. Um, and so anyway, so yeah, so it was kind of funny, uh, you know, when the boat was off the old trailer and, and, um, I went, went down there and I saw the old trailer on, you know, on a, um, couple of horses it was on top of those mm -hmm. metal horses and was walking around the trailer looking i was not aware of the amount of damage that was underneath 
the trailer. Um, it was it was mind boggling because I would have never driven it down there if I if I knew that. Is this the same um, trailer you were toting around to snowy Cleveland a couple of weeks ago trying to find an open boat ramp? Oh hell yeah! Okay, hell yeah! And so so yeah, so that was crazy. Um, I got a I ordered a bunch of pow rods. They came in. Um, th- things are starting to flow, man. I'm I'm like re rigged. I got new rods re-rigged everything up and and you know now the boat and it's the electronics on the boat that's coming saturday i'm so excited i'm gonna feel like a whole human being again because honest to god i mean if you guys are watching it's been two years dude if you guys are watching my instagram the last couple of months there's been almost no no posting because i've been so live in cleveland in the winter time but well no because i fish all winter but it but what the problem is is that i have been so busy with painting baits and and work that i haven't been able to literally leave the basement i mean Mm -hmm. i've been just working lure net is about to go off the hook guys um i'm just gonna tell you right now i've got so much coming out there's gonna be a signature series baits um that i designed specifically for the signature series they're they're going to be a one and done bait so once they're gone they're gone but i'll announce when those are coming out um i've got a ton new colors and stuff coming out tomorrow um is going to break march 1st the deep little end and the deep tiny end are going to come out in table rock craw, swamp craw, orange belly craw. Um, those come out start tomorrow. Um, so you want to check that out, especially the deep little end. Um, it's a the deep little end is one of my early spring crankbaits where literally I use it once the water temperature hits around 39 to 40. Um, I'm catching them on it. Uh, so you'll want you won't want to miss out on that. Um, th- there's a new code, new BTL code, BTL capital BTL twenty four. New BTL code um, starts now, so you guys can reap the benefits of that. Capital um, BTL twenty four, fifteen percent off regularly priced items at LureNet.com. Bingo! You're on it, Matt. You are on it. Yeah, I even have a uh, little ticker scrolling across the bottom. That's perfect. Okay, so like I do this for a living or something. Sometimes you, I know it seems like you do it every day. <laughs> Weird how that works out. Weird how that happens. So okay, so um, the motor's good on the boat. Everything's good on the boat. Trailer's brand new. Looks amazing. Um, drives fantastically. It's I'm so excited. So anyway, so the other day I leave to go to go pick up the boat in the trailer. So I get up early because I got a pretty good drive ahead of me. It's it's pretty much all day. So I get up early and I cruise on out. And, you know, I mean, I'm used to logging a lot of road hours from when I was on tour. So so it's just it's like, OK, so I'm going to be in the car for nine and a half hours. You know what I mean? Mm hmm. <laughs> Cue the great lure night crash of 2024. <laughs> that was actually I mean, 2023. But I know, but that's kind of our claim to fame that we crashed the lure net site. <laughs> and, and you know the funny, <laughs> Matt, you know the funny part about that? We were joking about it. Yeah. We were joking about it on air, and sure enough, we we, we crashed it. Anyway. Anyway. So I'm driving down there, and, and you know... When you travel certain roads all the time, you kind of get, you you don't pay attention to too much. Like, like when I'm driving, I'm looking at deer and turkey and hawks and eagles and stuff like that. I'm not paying attention to regular Marty Stouffer and wild America going on over there. hundred percent. I love that with the two Rams button heads. Yeah. It's wild America. And it kind of looked like a poor man's (laughs) babe Winkleman. And then he comes on and traveled the country. (laughs) That's right. I do remember that. Oh, dude, that, that show jacked me up so big. I was running around the living room, just jumping off the couches, pretending I was a big horned dude, ram. When those rams smash into each other and you see 
they do the slow motion yep. and you see every this muscle in their body. This is Wild America. <laughs> God, I remember that show. We would VHS tape that and I'd watch them 10 times. VHS tape, dude. You're yeah. starting to date yourself <laughs> little by little. Yeah. Remember 8-tracks? <laughs> nope, that was before my time. That was your time. I know, I don't even know. I wouldn't even know what an 8-track looked like, to be honest with you, seriously. Yeah, basically, it's like putting a three-ring binder into a slot the size of a shoebox. My <laughs> my first was obviously the VHS tapes, and then uh, and the, no, the CD player came out when I was, you know, yeah right you know the first car yeah. had to have a kenwood cd player deck and then the really cool kids had like a six cd changer in their trunk yeah that's right the road anyway anyway we, trailer story. we digress so I'm, I'm i'm driving down the road and and i get probably <clears throat> a few three maybe three hours from home and i see a road sign that i've never seen in my life and the sign said, this is a safety zone, zero tolerance. Whatever that means, I don't know. But that's, and it was a big, giant yellow sign. So I'm like, safety zone? Well, I get like 50 yards past this sign. And I see over the hill into the woods, a tree down into the, I mean, a, a car wrapped around the trees down at the bottom of the hill. So I'm like, oh, well, safety first, obviously. Dude, I don't get another hundred yards and there's another car in the woods. So I'm, I'm like, you know, the only thing I could surmise was they must have had an ice storm that came through. Mm -hmm. People didn't realize it. Shh, shh, shh black ice off the road there you go but um but i just thought it was ironic it says you know safety zone and then as soon as you pass the sign there's cars all over the off the road so i go a little bit farther down and i see on the other side of the freeway a cop's got a guy pulled over and the guy's out of his car and i'm like and it looks like they're talking to each other so i'm i'm like you know, whatever. I don't pay much attention, but as I get closer, I see the guy <laughs> with his head tipped back, his finger on his nose and one leg in the air. What time <laughs> is this? 9 a.m., dude, on a oh, Sunday wow. morning. It's 9 a.m. on a Sunday morning. The dude's getting breathalyzed and getting the drunk test. And I'm, <laughs> I'm like, dude, how how bad is your life right now? I mean, I couldn't believe it. I, I couldn't believe it. It was nine in the morning. Wow. <laughs> yeah. On a Sunday morning. So did you get through the safety zone? Okay. Yeah, I made it, man. I made it through the safety. So zone. everything's, everything's well, golden. Right? Well, when I dropped the boat off there, don't rip, don't forget. They got nine inches of snow in, in wow. Tennessee when I dropped the boat off. So when I dropped the boat off, there was literally part of the, a lot of the streets were plowed because they don't have snow removal. And uh, there, as the snow started to melt a little bit, it, it turned into ice. So there was like four inches of ice. Mm -hmm. And when I pulled into the trailer place to unhook the boat, I had to pull in against the curb so the boat wouldn't slide down the down the parking lot. So, yeah, it was completely different. You know, I go down there now and the grass is green. The birds are chirping. It's warm out. It's like 70 degrees. I'm like, wow, what a difference of uh, makes. Scott does have a valid question. He wants to know what we're talking about today. Okay, so today we are going to be talking about, I'm going to be interviewing Matt on a recent fishing trip he did because um, I learned a lot from Matt when I was down there last year and started applying some of this stuff. And Matt had a guest that bid on his, um, the, the Bass uh, Hall of Fame. Yeah, CJ Glenn. I did the BTL experience. If you watch yesterday's show, uh, CJ was in studio, which I, phenomenal guest. He's a tournament fisherman from uh, kind of South Texas, works in oil and gas, three weeks on, three weeks off. And uh, it ended up like, interviewing him for half an hour on the Texas team trail stuff. And then we had Brandon belt on who played for what the 
Giants for like 11 or 12 years and then was with, uh, I want to say Toronto last year and then got into the tournament game. So we had him on and then Johnny Schultz. But it was a hell of a show yesterday. But then we went and jumped on the on the lake yesterday. Right. It was, it was very interesting. It, it was very interesting, especially taking into account what you talked about last week on day four. Right. So this is this is why this is why this was important for me to get into today. So if if you guys know about, you know, you watch day four and I'll explain bass behavior movements, how they are going to run through the this, this water system that they're in mm-hmm. different times of year and everything else. I, I'm not a, a pure forward facing sonar guy. So a lot of things I do is based on the knowledge of the animal, the knowledge of the bait fish and the knowledge of the lake Mm -hmm. with forward facing sonar. You can see this unfolding in front of you, um, without having to spend a lot of time fishing it to under, to fight, to figure it out. Like with 2d sonar, we go into an area and we have to fish that area. And then you have to have your bait choices predicated on if they're suspending, if they're on the bottom, if they're chasing, if they're on cover, if they're on structure, et cetera, et cetera. So, so when I was talking to Matt about um, his excursion yesterday, he had said a few things to me that were really eye-opening. Um, and they, they go hand in hand with all the map work we do and everything. Mm-hmm. So at that, at the, at this point, how did it start for you the, the other day? So, yeah, right? uh, one of the things that I always, you, you always talk about the cover and then, you know, we did a, uh, what I remember we did a bait fish series, yes. uh, last year where you went through threadfin, gizzard, blueback blue herring, other types of bait fish, uh, which I thought was some of the most, well, every day four is educational, but that series is well worth going back into the day four archives it's available on youtube it's available on itunes and listening to that bait fish series especially now because of how heavily bait fish oriented the fish are in my opinion across a lot of the country and that's whether you're finding bait fish on side imaging on your 2d imaging visually seeing then dimpling the surface or looking at them on forward facing sonar but uh it was interesting. So I took that bait fish and then I started out using your pat I will call it a pattern or generalizations from last show where, you know, it's a lake that I don't fish very often. Uh, I had not had any contours on it, but I had Scott at the bass tank reconfigure some stuff up front. So I would have two transducers for Santee Cooper. And I just, for the hell of it was like, I wonder if I've got anything on the Garmin map and it popped up and I had contours. Oh, sweet. So I was like, okay, well I'm going to take what Frank did last week and apply it to this lake using the forward facing sonar and then applying the bait fish to it. And it was very interesting because I started and I wasn't seeing anything. I wasn't seeing anything. We went, we caught one fish right off the hopper, uh, like a four pounder. And then we went three hours and we didn't catch anything. And we only saw a couple fish and I didn't see any bait fish. Well, right when I had put the boat in and we ran to a spot where I started, I went left. We went right a little bit and I saw one ball of bait fish out kind of in open water. So I wonder if, wonder if they're just, just bait fish related. Uh, so I ended up going back there and what I ended up finding was those fish were not relating to where they should have been in 52 degree water. They were 100% relating to the bait fish in an area of this lake that I had never been in. And I just kept following until I saw more and more bait and then boom, they, they started popping everywhere. We ended up doing 24 and a half, 25 pounds in the last three and a half, four hours of the day. Yeah. So, so those bass were actually pelagic. Yes. And they were in a part of the lake. It's like the only open water part of the lake. Right. The rest so, of it has all sorts of cover, all sorts of drains, all sorts of uh, cover for them to be in. And 90% of the bass were in open water, 
but they were relating to bait fish a hundred percent, even though they wasn't eye of the tiger, it wasn't dropping into it. They were around where those bait fish were. It was real interesting how that bait pulled them out of where they typically live to where they were feeding. Well, it's a, it's a unique situation predicated on the time of year and the water temperature that you have, because, um, the bait fish were acting like it was late winter. Mm -hmm. They weren't acting like it was early spring. They were acting more like it was late winter. And, and so that was the big, I think that was the big key that you, that you unlocked. I agree. So this is what I wanted to ask you. And I thought about it on the water because, uh, I talked to another buddy who fishes out there and he had been out there recently and I called him and I said, dude, from one to five, I said it was like a light switch turned on. And he goes, dude, that was the exact same for me out there. So I wanted to ask you about bite windows because my question was, did I pick the wrong section of the lake where I normally catch them, where I didn't see anything, or did I just happen was and you know that was from like 10 to 1 where we didn't find anything and then when i found him at from 1 to 4 we were fishing for 3 to 10 pounders on a, pretty much every cast and not all of them bit obviously but do you think that other part of the lake where they weren't before you think they showed up there like i my question to you which we'll talk which i want you to talk about is what is your experience with bite windows and how do you know if you're in a good the best section of the lake where the fish are or you just happen to be in a bite window where everything on the lake turns on and have you experienced that yeah 100 percent have experienced it um when I, when I know there's a specific bite window going on, I make sure I'm in my best place while that's happening. So should I have gone back to what I considered the quote best place to see that? No. But then there's also don't no. ever leave fish to find fish. That's no. what was going through my head on the water yesterday. Yeah, no, I would have never left those fish. Um, with the, with the advent of forward facing sonar, um, you found what you needed to find. You found the bait. The bass were with the bait. Clearly, the bass were with the bait. <clears throat> the section of the lake where you couldn't find them and you couldn't find the bait, there was probably a secondary pattern going on over there because it's cover heavy. Um, okay. Okay. So that, those bass there probably went to the bank because that's all they had over there. The mm -hmm. bait wasn't out over there. The bait was probably against the bank or the bluegills or the crappie were already going towards the bank. And so those bass in that section of the lake were probably doing a completely different pattern okay. um, than, than what you actually found. Um, the, the key in everything that you and I talk about on day four um, is bait and structure mm -hmm. and cover. I mean, obviously, right? And seasonal patterns. But different parts of the lake will fish differently. That's why those map sections where we divide the map up into sections and we do a section of the lake at a time because each section of the lake will and can fish very differently from one to the other. Mm -hmm. um, so that's what well, you witnessed. It was re you witnessed real life. I mean, yeah. you, you you know, and, and honestly, dude, you, I mean, you went there to forward face. I mean, right. you, you went there to scope. Yeah. And, and so you did what you, you did what you did and you found them and you found. So here's <laughs> what I've been, here's what I've been thinking for the past day. You know, we're big on, on trying to, to put things together. And I love how you take, you know, find where the bait is and then find structure that is at the same depth as where the bait is suspended. That's like mm -hmm. a, a deal. And then, uh, you always talk about how you have pelagic fish that that sometimes can meet with resident fish yeah. at key areas of the lake with the bait fish right there. After what we've been seeing for the last year, and the more I pay attention to it, I th I think Frank, and I think we're going to get into this more, especially with what we saw going down on the Elite Series and uh, last week on uh, Toledo Bend, dude. I think there's an entirely separate category for fish strictly relating to bait fish. Now they obviously have to come off of some cover. We're not saying that the fish are just roaming, but there is a category of fish that 
are not relating to anything except the bait. And that changes on a daily or hourly basis. But it's like an right. entirely yeah. different category of fish to target. Well, that's the pelagic bass. Yeah. Those are the bass that run under bait their whole lives. They, they come in to spawn and then that, that's it. And yeah. then they're back out there. Um, that's what that is. Those, those are bass that literally make their living chasing food. Uh, Pete says, I want to hear how your day started. Like what led you to do what you did? I've been to the lake before. Um, I had a idea of where they usually are on that lake. I started where it is. I caught one. Um, I looked at the water temp and said it's 52. Maybe they're, they, they're shallower than they normally are. So I went to the shallower end of the lake that had a lot of cover on it. And when I didn't see balls of bait, we only saw three or four fish. It didn't feel right. Then I just went back to where we caught the first fish and going the other way is deeper with less structure and said, okay, they have to be somewhere because I know there's a lot of fish population in that lake and I know that there's a lot of bait. So I literally put the trolling motor on high bypass and started covering water sweeping to see if I could a find fish or find bait. So that that's how it was. And then I kind of turned my brain off like, okay, let's not focus on the point. Let's focus on where I find it because that's what matters where the fish right. are. Right. hundred. Yeah. And that, that, that was the South end. It was down by the down closer towards the dam on the fisheries where we ended up catching them. Okay. So theoretically, if the bass were over deep water and they were three to five, three to six feet mm -hmm. deep, right? Yep. On the other end of the lake where you didn't find any, if you would have went to the bank and fished from shore to six feet out. They could have slid up there. With regular moving baits, traditional style fishing, mm -hmm. you probably would have caught some. Um, I don't know if you'd have had the day like you had um, because you were, you were definitely on a main population of fish. Mm -hmm. But you would have definitely caught fish. It, I, I don't think for a minute you wouldn't have caught them. It was just really interesting because I've been thinking about it a lot because I did the exact opposite on Washita, where I planned to fish deep. I stayed in the same area on day two and I slid up shallow and those fish, either the, the deep fish disappeared or the shallow fish turned on. But I was, you know, uh, 50 yards from the gut where I was catching them, but I slid up to three to six foot and caught 16 pounds on day two. It was like the 10th heaviest bag of the entire day of the open. So it was literally the opposite adjustment of what I made yesterday. I went from it, it, you know, I went from shallow to deep yesterday or shallower to deep yesterday. What's up, Bama? No, and then this, this is I link. went from deep to <laughs> shallow at uh oh, is this the new one? Yeah, this is Lynx. Look Lynx. At Look at her. What are you doing? Now get See, out I of can, here. I just can't trust cats. They just don't look trustworthy. <laughs> They're not. <laughs> but, but there yeah, are just but... a lot of different elements of, of what we've been talking about the past couple of weeks that I've experienced over the last couple of weeks on the water. It's it's fabulous to me because um because here, look, the reality of it is is that when I when when we fished together, you we were crappie fishing. We weren't mm -hmm. bass fishing. Um, truth be told, we were going to go to that lake that you guys went to. It's just too fishing. far of a drive. And I said, I want to catch crappie because we were catching, you know, dinner plate size crappie. So to me, that was fun because I don't, you know, didn't have a chance to do that before. So I really wanted to do that. But, um, but what, but it was the same thing. We would go for the crappie and we would, scan around scan around wouldn't see anything we would just keep moving and all of a sudden we would we would start to find you know we would start to see mm -hmm. crappie and then all of a sudden we were around them which was pretty cool that cat's thinking day 721 of my capture <laughs> a, little, a little sneaky so but no just i just there was a lot going on there that i uh i started to tell you off air and you're like we'll just save it and we'll just kind of talk about it on air it's just micro adjustments using general themes is that a fair assessment of it yeah yeah it is it is but I, what i like about it is the tournament that you started out deep and then had to go to the shallow to catch them yep 50 yards is nothing for a fish to move yeah i mean it's zero for a fish mm -hmm. to move 50 yards that's a couple tail pushes and a glide and they're there mm -hmm. um and what i noticed 
especially this time of year, when the bass want to go shallow, they go. They don't care about the weather or nothing. If, when they want to be shallow, they just they go. Um, it's the classic. Um, it was the same thing in the classic. Guys were fishing out in the drains off the shore and then by the end of the classic all those fish were caught off the bank except for that is one of the things that i do like about a an early spring classic is numerous times there's been a mid tournament uh adjustment that has led to the win i mean i can think of you know when jordan lee went to the uh wacky werbod hartwell uh christy also i mean there's been a numerous classics that 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 wave or that movement has happened. You know, it happened on grand yeah. too, several yeah. times you know, when Edwin won on grand too. Yeah. It, in Florida, it, I got burned hard by that. Um, I was catching my fish on the deeper grass edges. And of course I'm in Florida. So deeper is, you know, seven feet. Um, I was catching all my fish in practice on the deeper grass edges, tr- pretty traditional. Um, uh, Devil's horse, uh, speed worm, pretty traditional mm-hmm. stuff for Florida. Nothing, nothing crazy, but catching them and catching good ones. And in the tournament, um, when the tournament went down, it was like I was on the wrong lake. Um, <laughs> guys were weighing in gigantic monster bags of bass, and mm-hmm. they were sight fishing all of them. And, and it literally happened in a day and a half everything that I was doing turned into miniature bass city and all the big females went on the beds and the guys that, um, made that adjustment smoldered them. I mean, smoldered. So how do you determine when to start exploring and looking at different options? And when do you determine how to stay put because it's a timing issue or it just isn't developing. Like, I think that's maybe the million dollar question Yeah. as what, to when, when do you bail and start exploring or when do you stick to your guns and know that it's eventually going to pay off? Okay. So I learned this over the course of my tournament fishing mm-hmm. um, across the country. Um, I learned a valuable lesson. If you're on them in practice and you go in the tournament and it's not going like practice went, it's time to bail. You have to make adjustments. Now, when I say bail, I don't mean that doesn't mean necessarily bail on the area you're fishing and go to a completely new place in the lake. You you have to change what you're doing and, and you have to. If the fish are, if you're assuming that the fish are going towards shore, then you have to bail and you got to start going towards shore in the same areas that you were catching them in practice. Um, conversely, if it's if if it's after the spawn, if it's post spawn, and you're not catching them there, you have to start going out because they're going towards summer pattern. Mm-hmm. Um, I learned this early on in in my fishing um, because the one thing that I hated more than anything was to get absolutely crashed in a tournament. Um, I hated it more than anything. And I used to stay, if we didn't have a back-to-back event, if I screwed up the tournament, I stayed after and fished on the lake a couple of days to refigure out where I went wrong. So I could see, you know, based on my my l- lack of decision-making during that tournament, where I went wrong so I wouldn't do that mistake again. Um, And what I found, I don't live and die on anything ever. Um, But what I found out is structure fishing, offshore structure fishing. Here's a key. This is a, this is a really healthy nugget. I set up a milk run on my offshore structure fishing areas. If I catch fish offshore, they're there. Okay. But they don't always bite. And so I set a milk run up and I run my milk run. And eventually I'm going to hit one of those structural elements when the feed bag is on and I'm going to rail them. And I've had this happen to me so many times I can't count um, and have won, especially locally, tons of tournaments where I've started fishing offshore 
my places that I had found mm-hmm. fish on in practice and didn't catch them and didn't catch them and didn't catch them and didn't catch them. And then I run back to the starting point and load the boat and win the event. Um, because offshore fish have their bite windows. You were talking about bite windows Not, earlier. Yeah. Yep. What Off- triggers that bite window though? That's a great mystery. That's the big mystery. But okay. structure fishing, I always set up a run because if with what I found with with offshore, if I pull up on a place and the fish are there, I usually catch them immediately. And if I don't catch them immediately when I'm there, I have to run to a different offshore structural element mm-hmm. and and try that because because what happens is their bite window may not be happening it could be predicated on current you know there's a million reasons mm-hmm. wind shift um every, there's a million reasons and so so that's what i do but when i'm fishing shallow when those fish aren't there that's because they moved so they either went shallower or they started to go offshore and that's when I start to rehunt for it for the pattern, because the deeper the deeper stuff in the summertime, let's say um, late post spawn through summer mm-hmm. is stable. Though th- it's stable, those fish are there. There, that's where they want to be. That's where they're spending the time. Now it starts to change in the middle of summer because this is where forward facing sonar is going to get good, really good again, because then the bass start to suspend. Um, Like here, it happens about the first week in August, second week in August, the bass start to suspend. They're not on the structure anymore. And so they're, they're way more predicated on the bait and they're staying with the bait. Um, So, so this is what I kind of look for. But, um, yeah, dude, the shallow bite, like I, like, honestly, (laughs) everybody loves springtime fishing and don't get me wrong. It's a great Mm -hmm. time to fish. It puts all the bass within reach or most of the bass within reach. It's probably my least favorite because, because those fish can, can change on you in a minute. And so you got to constantly be aware of that. Because uh, I said, I said, well, damn, I wish we'd come down here first thing. We got out there around 10, 10, 30, 11. Now it's probably 11, 10, 30, 11. Yeah, it was probably after 11. And I said, uh, I said, man, I wish we, I wish I, you know, ran down here first. And he goes, or, <laughs> uh, well, CJ said something smart that he goes, or we should have just gotten lunch and not launched until one. So right. I, <laughs> I was thinking that I was in the wrong areas. CJ was thinking, it's a bite window, which are two completely different trains of thought. But it, I was like, you know, hey, that's a valid point. Like maybe, maybe they just weren't. Maybe they needed to get a little higher. Maybe that water needed to get a little warmer. Maybe that bait needed to get more positioned to where they wanted to chase it. Because then I said to him, I said, well, I was at like three thirty, we're we're wrecking them. I'm like, well, maybe we should run back to where we started like maybe they're going there like that would determine whether it's a bite window or an area and he just looked at me and he's like i'm not really in any hurry to leave this section of the lake and i was oh, like yeah that's, good. No. that's a good point but yeah, in my mind like i wanted to know is it a bite window is it location and that would have been a great way to to figure out like if i had gone to the you know back to where i thought i was going to catch him would we have seen a bunch of them there or would it have still been a ghost town? But then by the time we ran there and came back, we would have, you know, probably missed, you know, I would have, that was the difference between three or four good fish. Right. Well, but I mean, here you were there and you did, you did forward face it. And mm-hmm. so you didn't see him there. <laughs> yeah, I know. I'm going to put her, I'm going to put her on my bald head. I'll look like Daniel Boone. <laughs> <laughs> but you, but, but you didn't see him there. So they weren't there. Yeah. The only different thing you could have done was went to the bank and and just fish conventionally, yeah. you know, on the bank in, in the other area. But mm-hmm. I but I would have never left where you were either. It was a good learning day. It was a really good learning day. Yeah, that's that's okay. why I wanted one more to question. We've done it. a lot of uh we caught them on a number of different baits, but uh we did get one jerk bait bite on a big one. And it was a headshot. And I know we've talked about uh, 
jerk baits a lot, but I don't think we've talked about how a fish is hooked on a jerk bait and what that tells you about your bait and how those fish are feeding. So the first three or four that we caught all outside of the head on the back, no hooks in the mouth when they really, when it, when you could tell that the fish were aggressive, we had three fish that had the jerk bait head first down in their gullets, like big fish too. Like to where you have to retie the six inches of your line because their sandpaper has roughed up six inches. That's how deep, but a, how the hell do they get it head first? And B, are you a big believer in how they're eating a jerk bait tells you if you're throwing the right one and how much they want it and the mood of the fish? hundred percent. I throw a lot of jerk baits and I can tell you this for a fact. When they take the jerk bait head first, they're totally taking it on the pause and they're swimming around the front of it and taking it head first. Because that's what I'm saying. Like that. Yeah. That's wild totally on the pause. So what happens is the, you're catching them in the side of the face. They're, they're smashing into those fish. The, a bass won't swallow a bait fish from the tail because if it's a spiny fish, like a bluegill or a crappie, they can't swallow it. So they have to get it to turn, turn it around so they can suck it in head first. Okay. And so if they're slashing at the bait, that's more reaction. Because it's going by them, they see it, you pause it, they whack it, and they get hooked in the side of the face. When they take it head first, more likely than not, you're bringing it to them. And you pause it, and they suck it in head first. Okay. Um, I've seen this so many times when Frankie and I are jerkbait fishing. I've seen it so many times. And the deeper the bass got it, mm-hmm. your retrieve is perfect and your color is perfect. And that's the deal. I mean, it's just. So when they're slapping at it, when it's on the outside, when you're hooking them up and losing it, is that what adjustments are you going to make then? Are you going to go color and size and depth on your jerk bait? Like, let's say you're throwing what you think it is, but you're noticing it's not an aggressive take. Yeah. I mean, it could be cadence could have to change. Your cadence could have to change. Um, the vibration on the bait could change. The color could change. There's a, there's a lot of variables on what you could change on a jerk bait, but the fact that they're reacting to it is a positive. So Clay says, that's what I was thinking. Headshot has to do with you jerking towards them rather than away. That is not true. That fish was no. following that bait. I was watching it on forward yeah. facing sonar and he, CJ loaded up to it. I mean, that fish came from far away, lit up on it. And then when he loaded into it, I mean, it came from behind the bait. We watched it trail right. the bait. And when it came, I mean, head was down its gullet. So the, on the pause, yep. that fish swung around and took it in head first. That's mm-hmm. what happened. Um, they can't swallow a jerk bait head first from behind it. They have to they have to get in front of it to eat it head first. So as he's pulling that jerk bait and then he pauses to pick up the slack to pull it again. Yep. As That's soon as that j- soon as that jerk bait mm-hmm. paused, that bass just rolled around and took it head first. Um, I've seen it a billion times. So that fish was a hundred percent committed, whereas the 100%. others were not a hundred percent committed. Yeah. That fish was eating that bait no matter what. Yeah. Yeah. That's- and that was during the prime feeding the two hours that we had where it was, you know, every fish was pliers on the front deck. Yeah, dude, I'm telling you, that's, that's fabulous, man. And, and bass, bass are opportunistic predators. If one goes, another one goes. Mm -hmm. Um, they're just, it's, it's like, it's like a sale in the mall. If the store's crowded and stuff's on sale, everybody buys. If, if, if people are walking around and nobody's buying anything, nobody hardly buys anything. It's Mm -hmm. the same thing there. It's bass are beautiful animals. They're wonderful creatures. The other crazy thing, and that we've talked about a little bit with schooling fish and competition is uh almost every fish we caught you could get the singles to follow it and if there was a a pair you'd get one that would turn away but if you had two fish that seemed to be in the same area but not running together and one fish got interested you almost always caught the fish that was further away 
And as soon as the one fish got really interested, the other fish would just shoot up past it and destroy it without a second thought. It was, yeah. it was wild how you could almost see that fish just not think, not analyze, just pure instinct, take what he could get before the other one got it. But if you had two that were kind of the same or a single one, they were way less willing to commit. A lot, we had several fish where we had one following it and one came out of absolutely nowhere and just drilled it. Yeah, it's that, that's that that's that predatory nature, man. Um, bass are just, well, all game fish, really. I mean, I, I have, when I snook fish with fly fishing, mm -hmm. when I snook fish with the fly rod, if I saw one individual, it was hard to catch them. But if there was three or four with them and I can get one to turn on it, they all went after it. Um, so, you know, it was... It, and then there you're sight fishing all the time because the water is like drinking glass clear. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I would see a couple of torpedoes coming at me. And if I saw more than two, I was, I was on it and I would strip that fly by them so fast. If I, if one would turn around, <laughs> they would all go. And then you just get the fastest one or the closest one to the fly. It was just cool. Cause it was a fun day of fishing. Uh, we had time to figure it out. We had time to analyze it, to talk about it. You know, there was nothing on the line. I felt a little pressure just because, you know, he's supporting the Hall of Fame. I wanted to put right. him on. I, you know, we we're originally going to go crappie fishing. He's like, dude, can we go bass fishing? And I said, yeah, yeah, we can go bass fishing. Uh, so I wanted to make sure that he had a good time. And then once we started catching him and we were talking and he's real analytical on the water, too. There's just a lot of stuff that I was like, man, this this would be a good some good questions, selfish questions, but some good questions for Uncle Frank on this deal. No, it's a good, I was very intrigued by it. Um, when we talked a little bit about it, I was very intrigued, um, for selfish reasons for me too, because mm -hmm. I'm trying to learn the forward facing sonar game. And my goal is to become eventually one of the best at it. So, you know, the more knowledge that you get, listen, in f fishing is a game of fishing is a game of knowledge and instinct. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, if somebody's instincts are no good, their knowledge is only going to be so helpful. So you need kind of a mix of both worlds into it. Um, and I'm, I am a um, researchaholic in a sense of if I, if I'm doing something fishing wise and I'm not good at it, then I'm going to do it until I become great at it. Mm -hmm. And so I will put myself in a position to fish that pattern or that bait or that thing when it's applicable, obviously, like I'm not going to go experiment with a Carolina rig during the spawn offshore. You know what I mean? <laughs> so, so you want to put yourself in the position of where the fish are at. So for, so selfishly, I want to know everything I can know about, you know, how you scoped them, where you found them, what, where were they, what were they doing? You know, that kind of thing. So this is the other wild thing. Uh, there would be some that you knew were bass, big bass, and they wouldn't react to the bait. So I dug in my glide bait box and I pulled out that big spro glide bait. And I said, I'm just curious. Now I never got one to commit. But the same fish that you know you're putting a, a smaller soft swim bait, a jerk bait, a Demiki around, and they're neutral towards it, every single one of them would turn on that big glide bait and be interested in it. No kidding. And <laughs> I, I thought that was fascinating. And it was also, you know, they weren't, they, they weren't rushing towards it like the fish that we caught where they, you know, swim up and kind of dart around, but it was, you could literally see them make note of it, notice something bigger in the water, sp spin and then track it. Yeah. But they wouldn't react to other baits at all. So I was like, dude, like you got to keep this out on the front deck now. Well, yeah, a hundred percent. I mean, uh, you know, I, 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 you know, I talked to Ben all, a lot and, um, he's always got those big giant baits out always at least one. Clay said, maybe I should have one even bigger. I, I don't carry anything over an eight inch bait in the boat. 
Yeah, that's that's sizable. That's like throwing a honey baked ham. I uh, yeah, I have <laughs> I have a couple of the like uh eight inch gizzard glides and stuff in the boat, like two of them, and the rest are that six and a half to seven inch, still an ounce and a half. Like the biggest thing, I don't have anything much bigger than a Roman main negotiator, which used to be cutting edge. Now it's like dinosaur stuff, but still a really good glide bait. And I've got some you know, tater. I've I've got a good glide bait box, but it's all tournament size glides. It's not the giant glides. Right. You're not you're not trophy hunting. Yeah. With them. But it would be interesting, like Clay said, like if I, you know, threw a hinkle at them or something gigantic. We should do that one time, just to experiment and see. Yeah. What happens? No, we can do it. But it it just it like I said, it tied together like six or seven shows that we've done over the past year. It was a great learning experience yeah. and an example that I was pretty excited about when I got off the water. Uh, and another example of how staying on the water, like I feel like I'm a better angler today than I was when I launched the boat yesterday. And it's a perfect example of how staying on the water, being open to things, changing, using your experience, but also letting the day dictate how, right. where and what you do is important so. yeah it's critical i mean it, you know we we talk about a lot of things on the show and i say over and over and over again not nothing nothing is better than time on the water nothing mm -hmm. is um i mean I, you got to have some semblance in knowing what's going on but but time on the water makes your decision making process click right away you recognize things and the more you spend fishing the more time you spend fishing the faster you get at it Mm -hmm. So the, the, there's not a time waste anymore. You're not wasting a lot of time going, well, should I do this or should I do yep. that? And you it was interesting because it was, you know, public body of water, a lot of tournament pressure on it. You can make a lot of decisions on it. Uh, so, you know, they were, it wasn't like, you know, they were virgin fish. Like they, they're normal right. everyday fish that, you know, move because of angling pressure and things like that, I would imagine. Yeah, but that is really cool. I, I, I'm really intrigued by the whole thing. Um, you know, I, 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 I have issues right now with, I keep, I keep, I, I hate to say instinctively fishing because it's, it's not, I, I don't think it's instinctive. I think it's just applying everything I've learned over the years with patterns and Mm -hmm. types of lakes and vegetation, et cetera, et cetera. I apply all this to, to how I fish every single day. Mm -hmm. um, I believe truly that I can probably go to any lake and catch a fish. I mean, I, I don't think I'm not going to launch my boat and not catch them. Um, it may take me a day or two to figure it out, but I believe in the end I'm going to catch fish. Um, but with, with the new, with forward facing sonar and me, um, I'm having a tough time going, okay, I'm just going to, I'm scoping, I'm scoping because I always, mm -hmm. I'm looking at my 2D, I'm looking at my map. And maybe you don't have to do that. I mean, you're not I trying to fish so. the elite series. Maybe, and it was interesting, I was reading one of the fantasy fishing things that they're, they're putting the guys into three groups, uh, old school, or they cut bank beaters, but old school scopers and then a hybrid. Yeah, I, I I would consider myself a hybrid. I'm do not... whatever the hell you enjoy the best, unless you're trying to do this for a living, which right. only a couple hundred guys are. If you don't like it, then don't go do it. If you want to use it a little bit, use it a little bit. If you want right. to spend some days with it, use it. If you want to don't spend some days with it, use it. Do whatever the hell makes you the happiest. 99.99% exactly. of us are out there to become better anglers, to experience the journey, to enjoy the ride, and to have a great time on the way. Right. Oh yeah, there's no question about it. Um, you know, I'm I'm I, clearly I don't compete anymore, so it's it's not it's, my boat's never going to be set up like some of the guys on tour. Mm -hmm. um, it's just never going to be set up that way. That's just not not how it's going to in it going to go. Um, and I'm always going to use everything that I've ever learned um, to find fish and to put me in areas where fish should be. Um, but the, but the but live scoping is going to enhance what I'm doing now. Um, my my thing my problem and it's a problem is that when I get into something or onto something I want to be the best at it, mm -hmm. and so I am like hardcore willing to dive into the into the scoping game 
just so I can understand it better. I, I want to understand it better because then when I talk about it, um, I have the knowledge to speak on it. If I don't have the knowledge to speak on it, I, I'm not going to talk about it because I'm not going to lie. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Or I'm not going to be misspoken. Um, so that's kind of where I'm at with it. But I see what you're doing with your boat set up and you're going in the direction that probably for you, you need to go. Yep. It is. You know what I mean? Especially if you, if you have aspirations of, of competing, you're, you have no choice. As Frank, I do have aspirations of competing. I'm aware of that. <laughs> uh, all right. Let's wrap things up for today. But first, 70% uh, off of apparel on the LureNet site. So, like, if you want a rebel <laughs> hat. We're, at, we're doing a bass show, and you go right to Lindy. <laughs> yeah. If you want a rebel hat, Cotton Cordell, Bandit, they're $2.99, folks. A uh, The T-shirts on here are $6.99. Sweatshirts, $12.99. All sorts of cool stuff on there. Super discounted on that. Which brings me to uh, our clothing, which we are going to launch on March 25th, the Monday after the Bassmaster Classic. The store will be open the uh 25th for 14 days two weeks all new designs uncle frank your signature series line of smallmouth largemouth and spotted bass hand-drawn t-shirts will be available on that drop long sleeve short sleeve really cool stuff it'll be open for two weeks starting on the 25th uh and that will be through basszone.com and we're and we'll announce it more times yes too. and we'll announce it but letting everybody know the 25th is when the brand new 2024 frank scalish apparel will be available and then we will have a second drop the beginning of june with a new t-shirt and then frank is has some badass hats coming to some signature series hats so focus yeah, big focus sweet. on the signature big focus on the fish drawing uh i'm i'm very excited for that all new btl logo design also dropping on the 25th you've seen it i'm obsessed with yeah. it yeah it, it's good looking stuff so all right really back to is. uh lure net there uh and then then tomorrow. also yeah, so to, the FX colors are still available. Um, now, tomorrow, what we're going to have is we're going to have those crop patterns coming out in the deep little end and the deep tiny end. So instead of the baby in the middle, now they'll have the whole family with these colors. Correct, correct. Okay. So and, and the deep little end, guys, don't miss out on that bait. That'll work. And then just to reiterate, if we haven't driven the point home, uh btl 24 btl 24 <laughs> you guys use the hell out of that you get you don't understand how much we appreciate the btl oh yeah uh, 24 well it's good it's good because it gives you a break on the price but it also lets them know um how loyal the listeners are to day four which is fabulous and and, it, and very much appreciated Stop looking at that tournament. Man. Well, here's what I was going <laughs> to end with. Uh, Wesley Gore has a uh, three for 26. Two. Holy moly. Three bass for 26. Seven, now. three, eight, six, and 10, nine. Re remember, this is Thursday, the 29th, the first day of the tournament. It's 9.30 a.m. Central. It's 8.30 or 10.30 a.m. Eastern. We got a Rojas watch going. 45-2. He's got three for 26-11. He gets two more heavy nines. He's got all day to do it. 45 twos in jeopardy, folks. That is insanity. And then the controversy can start on whether you can do a catchway release on a slot lake that it would it would break the record. It's an official Bassmaster tournament. Yeah, but it but but it's done legally. 
It's a yeah. it's catch and release, so it doesn't make a difference. I think Rojas might beg to differ on that, but we'll cross that bridge when we get there. Did, now he <laughs> caught him on. He caught him on. Uh, he caught Toho. Him, uh, Toho. That's the turn sight was. fishing. That was when he literally yeah. was fishing, and the eight to ten pounders were swimming under his boat at the mouth of that backwater, and he was yeah. watching them like a herd of wildebeest on the Serengeti flood yeah. into the backwater area. I'm just gonna say that was the tournament I was talking about <laughs> when I said, "What lake am I on?" That's the very event. <laughs> all right. This was a good show. This was an eclectic show. Uh, I learned a lot during this show. Hopefully all the listeners I and viewers did too. Yeah. All of you guys, thank you also for tuning in on a live Thursday. Next Thursday is day one of the Bassmaster Open on Santee Cooper in South Carolina. Hopefully uh, right now I have a functioning lower unit that is still intact and <laughs> You don't ever and, say that, dude. You never say that. <laughs> I could hope. Uh, that's all I've got. I, all, I, all I've got is hope. So uh, next week's show is going to be a cool. Uh, yeah, I guess we should figure out what next week's show is before I promote it, but it'll be a recorded show. It's going to be a recorded show. We're trying an experiment that if it works, um, if it works, then we're going to have um, we're going to throw this in every now and then for a massive audience participation. Um, I'm, I'm not going to let the cat out of the bag, but a lot of guys are going to like it. And probably a lot of guys are going to hate it. How's Ooh. that for a teaser? There you go. Hey, I know day four is kind of a standalone show for BTL. I'm really proud of the regular BTL shows that we've done this week. Had Mark Zona oh, uh, on oh. Tuesday got it and it will be inducted into the 2024 yeah. hall of fame along with uh uh fred arbergas he was pumped that the guy you know a top water alfred williams fred arbergas uh skeet reese and uh mckinnis all inducted this year so yeah i was I really pumped with that show i that's worth a watch like he really goes into some deep stuff and then brandon belt yesterday longtime major league baseball player current major league baseball players jumped into the tournament scene and the tackle scene with uh splitting the ownership of tackle addict uh with brian robinson who played for the vikings was a super cool guest yesterday like i was super impressed with his you know he he just got into bass fishing in 2020 during the pandemic uh and has jumped in head first and plans to be a part of this industry for as long you know I said, you know, when you're finally retired from major leagues, he's like, no, this is it. This is the next chapter. Perfect. So really excited about that. I got to give a shout out to Zona. Um, very well deserved. Um, he, you know, I mean, it, he, he really became an icon in this industry. Mm -hmm. I mean, he really did. So I, I got to give him a shout out and to everyone else who made it. Um, but I know, but I know Zona personally. And so, you know, Hats off, bro. Good job. All right. Got anything else? No, nah, dude. Just, uh, you know, I can't wait to get my boat going. I'm, I'm ready to fish my brains out. <laughs> All right. This has been another edition of Day 4 with the Man. Frank Scalish. Same place. Same time. Next week. See ya. <laughs>